Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Living New Deal webinar. My name is Bridget Boyle, and I am your technical assistant today. If you should have any problems with any technical things, you can go ahead and put a comment in the chat. You can send it directly to the panelists or uh, to everyone if you feel like that works. And um, if you have questions that you would like to be addressed, um, you can put them in the Q&A. It's much easier for us to track the questions if you put them in the Q&A as opposed to the chat. The Q&A function can be found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So uh, please do put your questions in there as they come up and we will address them in the Q&A section of the webinar. Um, I think that's all I have to say. So in the meantime, I welcome you and here is Susan Ives to further welcome you to the webinar. Hello everyone. Welcome to tonight's Living New Deal webinar, A New Deal for Native American Art. I'm Susan Ives, the Living New Deal's Director of Communications. Tonight's is the second webinar in the Living New Deal's monthly series, The Art of the New Deal. The webinar series explores the many and diverse cultural arts programs the New Deal made possible and what a new New Deal for the arts could do today. You can learn more about our programs at our website, livingnewdeal.org. And while you're there, you might also sign up for our newsletter, The Fireside, and invitations to events like these. The Living New Deal is a nonprofit organization that started at UC Berkeley about a dozen years ago. Our mission is to preserve the New Deal's legacy nationwide, make people aware of what the New Deal was and did, and to promote the New Deal as a model for government today. The New Deal's legacy is disappearing bit by bit as New Deal post offices, schools, city halls, and more are demolished or repurposed. The artworks they contain are often removed or become inaccessible to the public. The Living New Deal discusses these concerns and many other topics related to the New Deal's history and what it teaches us today. Our website catalogs nearly 17,000 New Deal sites that volunteers around the country send to us, which we add to the growing archive. We hope you'll visit the website, which drew more than a million visits last year alone. The New Deal is sometimes criticized for failing to diversify its jobs relief programs. But the New Deal was more inclusive than many people may realize. The various federal arts programs in particular were among many government efforts to engage women and minorities despite the widespread gender and racial discrimination at the time. Though well-intentioned, these programs weren't always effective or bias-free. Our guest tonight is Dr. Jennifer McLaren. She will talk about Native American arts and crafts and how the so-called Indian New Deal sometimes undermined its intentions to help Native American artists and communities. Jen formerly taught Native American art history and museum studies at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. She is the author of A New Deal for Native Art, Indian Arts and Federal Policy, 1933 to 1943, and a forthcoming book, A New Deal for Navajo Weaving, Reform and Revival of Diné Textiles. It will be out in May. Jen is currently working with the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, curating an upcoming exhibit on a Navajo weaver, which I hope she will tell us about. Please post your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Jen will answer as many as time allows following her talk. These webinars will be posted to the Living New Deal website and also on our Facebook page. Thank you all for tuning in and for your support of the Living New Deal. And welcome, Jennifer McLaren, and thank you so much for being with us. Great. Thank you, Susan. Um, and thanks for inviting me. This is a real pleasure to present to you guys. Um, I'm going to have uh, Bridget is helping us, um, and she is going to advance the slide. So I'm going to say next slide every once in a while. So that's that's what that's about. Okay, so my first slide, just the introductory one. Let's go to the next one. I just wanted to show you, just kind of to reiterate. Next slide. Um, okay, we can start with this one. That's fine. All right. So um, 
as Susan was saying, I've published two books so far on, on New Deal Native Art. Um, I have another one in the works um, on Native Arts and Crafts Cooperatives. Um, let's go back to the previous slide. Rachel, there may be um, a slideshow. The slides may be advancing by themselves. I guess I should have tried this. Oh, I'm hoping. I see. Not. Got it. I will. I will fix that. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. It's just gonna. You know. Let me just stop the share and fix it, and I'll be right back. Please okay. Excuse yeah. me. Um, okay. So as Susan was saying, I've published two books: um, A New Deal for Native Art. That was the first one, and that was based on my dissertation. Uh, based on my graduate work at the University of Washington, I actually started studying this topic that long ago. And my most recent book was the research that I've done over the last 10 years, and that's A New Deal for Navajo Weaving. So that book concentrates on uh, specifically on Navajo weaving programs. Uh, Navajo weaving was one of the first Native arts that um, the New Dealers uh, focused on, they wanted to improve the production and also the marketing of uh, native arts and crafts. And Navajo weaving was a form that had a very extensive market and they felt they could really make a mark there and do something significant. Well, it turned out that, that their plans uh, for Navajo weaving weren't quite as successful as they had desired. But they did accomplish a lot. Okay, so let's start with John Collier. Um, probably if, if you know anything about the New Deal and about Native Affairs, you know about John Collier. John Collier was the Commissioner of Indian Affairs during the New Deal. Um, he was uh, actually selected by uh, Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior. They, they knew each other. They had mutual friends in Native rights organizations and had worked together for some time. But in 1920, Collier went to New Mexico and met Mabel Dodge Lujan, who was, uh, had a sort of salon in Taos and met with native artists there and intellectuals, D.H. Lawrence, a number of the Taos painters um, hung out with that crowd. Um, so she really fostered a sort of community of artists and intellectuals in New Mexico. John Collier visited there and he became immediately enamored of the Southwest native peoples, especially the Pueblo peoples. Um, after that visit, he worked as a research agent with the Indian Welfare Committee of the General Federation of Women's Clubs. The General Federation of Women's Clubs, um, they were very actively involved in native rights in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And then in 1922, he became executive secretary of the American Indian Defense Association, a very important native rights organization. And then in 33, he became the commissioner of Indian affairs. Next slide. Then Renee Darnancourt, who uh, became a very important protege of Collier, um, Renee Darnancourt was originally from Austria, emigrated to Mexico in 1926, and worked with a Mexican folk art dealer um, in Mexico, put together a large exhibition of Mexican arts. He had experience with folk art in Europe before he came to Mexico. Um, and so he put together a huge exhibition for the Metropolitan Museum in 1930 that was very influential. After that, he was appointed general manager of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, um, a new government agency that was created under John Collier to try to improve native arts and crafts, improve the production and improve the marketing. So when he appointed uh, Darnancourt as head of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, as general manager of it, um, Collier hoped that Darnancourt could do for Native American arts, what he had done for the folk arts in Mexico. He had been instrumental in the folk art movement there and John Collier wanted him to come to the US and um, do the same sort of thing to try to generate a market um, and then improve the production. And so he put together major exhibitions, he conducted surveys of Native arts. And then in 1949, he became director of the Museum of Modern Art. At that time, the Museum of Modern Art had um, a department of industrial arts, and that's what Darnancourt headed. 
Next slide, please. Um, and at this time, you know, most people who have studied um, Native culture, Native American cultures know a little bit about some of these problems, but I thought I would go through them. Um, problems facing Native people in the early 20th century, of course, the loss of land, lack of adequate health care, and a number of very serious health issues that were circulating, um, health problems that were circulating in Native communities, lack of proper nutrition, lack of proper housing, lack of religious freedom, um, including bans on dancing and other ceremonial activities, which included peyote use, um, and in a stimulist educational system where Native children were actually taken from their homes and forced into boarding schools away from home and forced to assimilate. And one of the huge problems that uh, Collier and his colleagues identified was that the boarding schools, next slide please, the boarding schools did not teach traditional arts, traditional native arts. They taught Western fine arts. Um, okay, so next slide, this is the next one, early 20th century native welfare groups um, that were active at this time were Friends of the Indian, like I said, the General Federation of Women's Clubs, which formed a special Indian welfare committee. American Indian Defense Association, Eastern Association on Indian Affairs, and New Mexico Association on Indian Affairs. Those last two were very instrumental in developing programs to aid the Native arts. Next slide. In 1928, um, a number of people who were very concerned about the, the state of Native peoples in, in America, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, convinced the government to conduct a survey um, commissioned by Hubert Work, the, the Interior Secretary at that time, at the request of the Senate. And they, they came out with a huge report in 1928. The Merriam Report is what it's called. It's typically known as. Their findings were substandard health care, substandard education, boarding schools needed to be replaced with reservation-based schools, a number of different problems that they identified. But one of the things that they expressed great concern about was the fact that Native arts were disappearing because the knowledge of Native arts, how to make them, how to gather the materials, how to gather them properly, sometimes in a ritual manner, that knowledge was dying with elders. They also uh, learned that women were the primary producers of arts and crafts among American Indian people and that arts and crafts were a very significant source of income. Next slide. So their recommendations were greater appropriations for the Indian service, that they should be doubled in fact. Native arts and crafts production should, should be encouraged and especially among women because it was a traditional uh, sort of communal activity among women. And federal, the federal government should support the production and sale of Native arts to include these things that um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board would come to focus on. So assistance in production, assistance in the market, conducting workshops, teaching the arts and crafts in the native schools, and then establishment of uh, standards for the production of the arts and crafts and marks of authenticity or trademarks. Because there was, um, there were a number of knockoffs on the market. There was a lot of imitation, a lot of inauthentic art out there and they wanted to, um, curtail that as much as possible. Next slide. So this is an example of the kind of art instruction that you saw in the Indian boarding schools. This is a Phoenix Indian art school, um, plaster casts, portrait painting, portrait drawing, um, drawing from life. Um, all of the Western art traditions were taught in the boarding schools and in most schools, there were a few that allowed it, but in most schools, uh, the students were not allowed to do any native art forms. Next slide. The tourist market was identified as another major problem because native craftspeople were producing goods for the tourist market, but they were pressured to create those goods quickly and at low cost. And so the quality of what they were making was diminished. Next slide. So one of the things that the Indian Arts and Crafts Board focused on when it was formed, um, and especially under Renee Darnancourt, uh, 
was um, the negative influence of tourism on the native art market. Um, so they developed a set of aims to educate producers in traditional techniques and materials, stimulate an upscale market, um, establish workshops, trademarks, marks of authenticity, provide government loans. This was very important because the, the native people were not able to get loans. Um, they weren't able to get credit. So um, under the Indian Reorganization Act, that was part of you know, what provided for this, uh, this new capacity and provide business and marketing assistance, business training and marketing assistance. Next slide. The Santa Fe Indian School was the site of a very, very important project during the New Deal. Um, next slide. There was a school teacher there named Dorothy Dunn um, who taught painting and she had studied native art. She was an educator. She'd gone to the University of Chicago, studied art education. And then she traveled around the United States um, to her and her goal in this travel was to try to come up with a form of painting by visiting native artists and by visiting museums and seeing work that have been done in the past, come up with a form of painting that could be identified as typically Indian painting. Um, and so what she did was she came up with something that, that basically combined Plains painting traditions and Pueblo painting traditions and some other influences, put them all together and came up with a very distinctive style that she taught to her students at the Santa Fe Indian School. Most of the students there were from either the Pueblos or they were Navajo. Um, some were from the Plains and from other areas, but it was mostly Southwest kids from Southwest tribes that went to school there. Um, it became known pejoratively as the Blue Deer School um, because um, people started to see this as a form of painting that looked very sort of cartoonish, looked like children's storybook art. And um, while uh, many, many artists adopted it and many artists studied the Santa Fe Indian School and had very su successful careers based upon it, there were severe limitations to the style that she was teaching. Next slide, please. This is a good example by Navajo artist Harrison Begay of some of the characteristics of that style. Um, it had no uh, Western perspective traditions in it. Um, it, if they wanted to convey a sense of um, receding into the distance, the figures would put higher up on the plane and uh, there would be a layering of one figure and over another, but there wouldn't be any diminishment as they receded into space like we would represent in Western painting traditions. Um, figures were uh, surrounded with a black outline that flattened the figures out. So it was very, very flat um, and a very, very distinctive style, but something that was, that was developed really by a white woman um, and imposed through her instruction at the Santa Fe Indian School on her students. Next slide. When Dorothy Dunn left, she was actually at the Santa Fe Indian School for only a few years, but then when she left, a student of hers, Euronima Cruz Montoya, who is from San Juan Pueblo, took over as the instructor and she taught in the same way. She used the same methods that Dorothy Dunn used. So this style of painting was perpetuated. Next slide. So while the Santa Fe Indian School imposed a particular style of painting on students, um, it also did bring in teachers who taught traditional forms like Pueblo pottery. You see Maria Martinez from San Ildefonso here teaching pottery to the students. Next. Students doing embroidery, next slide. More, and this is at the Fort Wingate, Fort Wingate Indian School. So the Santa Fe Indian School was sort of a proving ground for certain techniques and, and educational techniques and methods. And a number of those same methods were used at the Fort Wingate Indian School. Next slide. <coughs> Another BIA school. Um, so the two, probably the two most important uh, Indian schools at that time were Fort Wingate and the Santa Fe Indian School in terms of how they affected native art in the future. Um, the Indian Arts of the Craftsport also got busy and uh, published a series of books 
uh, on native crafts um, by Anglo or by non-native um, writers, but they uh, put together, we can go through these quickly. There are three or four of them of the different publications. So let's go to the next slide. Quillen Beadwork, the Western Sioux, next one. And Navajo Native Dyes. These were all published by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, printed at the um, Indian boarding schools and disseminated through um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board and through the BIA. Navajo Native Dyes, the preparation used, is still used today. Very, very important publication. What they did was a, a Native woman who was a weaving teacher at the Fort Wingate Indian School and the wife of the director of the school who taught home economics, um, they got together and they went around and they interviewed people about the different dyes that were used in the area, different dyes used on the reservation, um, and published this sort of compendium of all these dyes, all the natural dyes. This had never been done before. Very important publication. Next one. And Pueblo Crafts. So these publications were put out and then used in the Indian boarding schools, which transitioned to day schools during the New Deal. So the students were no longer sent off across the country, say to Pennsylvania from Arizona to go to boarding school. They had their schooling on the reservation more commonly. Um, and this was initiated during the New Deal. And these publications were used in the schools to teach the press to the kids. Next slide. Um, Museums were also open, Museum of the Plains Indian in Browning, Montana, and the Sioux Indian Museum in Rapid City, South Dakota. So they realized that if they were going to teach traditional native arts and crafts, they needed to have examples that people could come and see, that the artists could come and see to use as models and to study. So they, they uh, amassed collections and opened museums in places where they could be accessed by the native artists. Next slide. Um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board also organized huge exhibitions at the San Francisco Golden Gate International Exposition in 1939. They had a very large exhibition of native arts that was very influential in um, raising awareness about native arts. And Rene Darnikert was very heavily involved in this. He had a, a huge background in um, exhibition um, display techniques and marketing. And so he was very, very good at that. Next slide. And the San Francisco Golden Gate Expo um, exhibition of native art was kind of a um, practice run for Indian art of the United States, which was held at the Museum of Modern Art in 1941. Um, this is uh, an image of, of the uh, Barrier Canyon murals. Next slide. That was incorporated into the display. Um, the Museum of Modern Art um, was chosen because Darnancourt felt that Native Arts needed a um, very, very important prestigious venue in New York. And uh, the Museum of Modern Art, at, at that time, they were very interested in folk art, industrial arts. Um, so this was something they, they went for and they, um, they went all out on. Um, there was an actual uh, Northwest Coast totem pole outside the entrance to the museum. That pole has disappeared. We don't know where it is. No one has been able to find it. Uh, next slide. There was an exhibition of Navajo weaving, but it was very sort of a, a very sort of conventional exhibition, um, very ethnographic type display showing how uh, traditional Navajo wearing blankets were worn. You can see they're on forms here, on dress forms, so you can see how they're worn. But then another important emphasis of the exhibition, and this took up uh, all the floors of the Museum of Modern Art. The whole museum was dedicated to this exhibition. Next slide. Um, Darn Court also wanted to show people, show visitors that native arts and crafts could be used in modern home decor. So here you have a Navajo chief blanket, which today would be worth a lot of money on the floor under a pedestal with a uh, Pueblo pot on top of it as an example of showing how you can display things in your home. Next slide. Um, so the, the Indian art for modern living section of Indian art of the United States was intended to show people 
how they could incorporate elements of native art and craft into uh, contemporary clothing, into design, uh, contemporary home decor. Here you see um, the, the fabric that's draped down is seminal patchwork. And then you see in the display case, um, a uh, ski suit by, by the designer uh, Picard with seminal patchwork on the front of it. Next slide. Here's a little better image of it. Um, so they had major designers come in and design outfits, next slide, that used elements of native art and craft. Um, here's an evening gown with um, Pawnee Riverwork applique applied. Next slide. And Darren Court felt it was very important that Indian art of the United States you know, be in New York, um, that it be in um, a major uh, center of marketing, uh, a major consumer center, because he, he really wanted to develop forms of native art that could be used in home decor, that could be used um, extensively in the modern context. Um, another thing that the Indian Arts and Crafts Board did was they um, promoted production of murals. So we all know about the New Deal, New Deal mural projects. Well, most people, or maybe not most people, but a lot of people don't know that they included native artists. Um, the Department of Interior Building, they uh, constructed a new building in DC and they paid native artists, next slide, to produce murals for the building. Um, Collier was very determined to hire as many native people uh, to work for the BIA as, as he could, and he actually did pretty well. He hired quite a few people, and he wanted them to be in an environment in the Department of Interior building where their culture was honored. Um, because of course the DOI building is full of, full of murals from other American artists, and he, he and Ickes, both were adamant that they have native artists included. This is Gerald Naylor, a Navajo artist. However, most of what they included as subject matter in these murals, and we can just flip through a, a few here so you can see, next slide. Um, traditional dancing, traditional ceremonial activities, next slide. Hunting, next slide. Um, and murals were also produced for BIA schools and for administration buildings. This is, these are some murals by Charles Loma Hopi, who became very well known later on as a jeweler. Next slide. So as you can see from the slides that we saw, they, they tended to portray, portray very traditional activities and um, ceremonies, uh, hunting, uh, courting rituals, those sorts of things, really concentrated on the past, on traditions, rather on traditional activities, rather than contemporary life. The Navajo Nation Council House was the site of another important mural project. Next slide. It was built to look like a hogan, eight-sided. <coughs> um, and Gerald Naylor, Navajo painter, next slide was commissioned to paint murals for the interior. All eight walls have murals. One of those has been uh, covered over. The uh, Navajo did not like the subject matter of one of the murals and they covered, with, covered it with the seal of the Navajo Nation. Next slide. But the others are still there. You can, you can go and view them. And the, the mural cycle was called the history and progress of the Navajo people. So it, was, it told the history of the Navajo people, but only from the point of contact with whites. Um, and it was based on a, a Western conception of, of industrial progress, technological progress. Um, next slide. And on a Western educational system, because what you see here, um, the two young people in the top, um, there's, Naylor was going by a program that was set by one of the um, administrators from uh, actually from the Soil Conservation Service, which was very active on the Navajo Reservation at this time. So uh, an administrator, a white administrator wrote up the narrative for the murals and then uh, Naylor painted them. 
And the culmination of the mural cycle is with this young couple who are holding diplomas showing that they've graduated from the Western educational system. Next slide. So a particular um, view of progress and how to progress was displayed um, in those murals. Public Works of Art Project Indian Division, they, uh, they produced um, objects for buildings, new buildings that were built during, during this period uh, for the Indian service. So they decided they would decorate them with native objects. Um, so native artists were um, commissioned to do works for them. Next slide. Or I'm sorry, not commissioned, but under the program. Um, produced the works. Here is uh, a Navajo weaving that was produced under that program. Next one. And then another important um, uh, project of the time was restoration of ruins in the Southwest. Here you see uh, workers, Navajo workers at Casa Rincanada at Chaco Canyon. Next slide. So they went in and repaired walls, um, reconstructed some rooms at Kanishba Ruins uh, at that restoration project. Now I should mention that this is a civilian conserva conservation corps Indian division. Um, there was an Indian division and a lot of the work they did was actually in ruins restoration in the Southwest. Next slide. Wupatki, which is very close to Flagstaff here. They, they worked on restoration there, next slide. Tuzagut, just south of Flagstaff, next one. And Keat Seal, which, which is at Navajo National Monument, next. White House Ruin at Canyon de Chez, next slide. And then another important project was the Alaska Totem Pole Restoration Project. So um, young men in Alaska, were uh, brought together with older carvers, men who had retained their traditional carving techniques and, and the stories that go into the poles. Um, and the young men were brought together with these older carvers and they recarved. Um, sometimes they restored, sometimes they carved whole new poles and then mounted them in totem pole parks. Next slide. Here's an example of one. You can see the deteriorated pole on the left and then the recarving on the right. Next slide. Um, and then arts and crafts cooperatives were another project, a very, very important project of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, very heavily promoted. Uh, there was the Kuala Arts and Crafts Cooperative among the Cherokee, uh, Navajo Arts and Crafts Guild, of course, among the Navajo. Um, there were Pima and Papago projects. Um, there, were, there were actually um, a number of projects around the country. Next slide. And as I said, this is my next book on cooperatives, but I have done some uh, publication on that previously um, on Northern Plains cooperatives, which were run um, pretty much entirely by women. Um, very, very successful. The Northern Plains Cooperative uh, lasted in, well into the 20th century. I think it was maybe 15 years ago that it actually folded. So it was around for a long time. The uh, Cherokee Cooperative is still operating. The Navajo Arts and Crafts Cooperative is still operating. Next slide. Um, let's just go through these quickly. These are the Blackfeet Cooperative Association. You can see that they uh, took a an old log cabin and refurbished it. They would meet dressed up in um, the outfits that they had made. They would meet buses at Glacier National Park and had teepees set up that were um, actually furnished with all the traditional furnishings. Next slide. Next slide, I'll just go through these to show you. Okay, this one shows a particular, a, a jacket that was developed by the Blackfeet craft workers that has beading on the back yoke. Um, and these were sold at Abercrombie and Fitch um, and they were sold at other major department stores and major tourist sites. Next slide. This is a set of designs that was developed by one of the women who worked in the Blackfeet cooperative. And so she put together a whole uh, book of designs that could be used on the jackets. Next slide. Next slide. Some of the Blackfeet cooperative members 
And what I have done is I've, I've tried to um, include the names of the women that were involved in these cooperatives and these endeavors as much as possible to bring their name into the record. Next slide. So you'll see a lot of names of the women on here and because it's important to me. Um, another uh, Northern Plains Cooperative project where, and as I said, this was all with the assistance of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. Um, they uh, got a contract to provide curtains and bedspreads and other furnishings for the Noble Hotel in Lander, Wyoming. And you can go there today and still see some of these items. They have a display of them there. Next slide. Um, rooms, hotel rooms were decorated with themes. Uh, this one had to do with hunting. Next one. Next slide. This one had to do with the Sundance. So everything that was in the room, um, all the decorations, all the furnishings were produced by, or, or at least decorated by um, Native women in the Blackfeet Cooperative. And of course they, they realized a pretty healthy income from this. Next slide. Another cooperative, the Kateri Craftwork Cooperative, which was among the Skitswish or Coeur d'Alene people, um, very important beading traditions that were still going on there. Here you can see Sister Providencia Tolan, who is also known as um, uh, Sister Buckskin. Uh, she started the Kateri Cooperative and with the assistance of Darnancourt was able to display the work that these women produced at the, at the uh, San Francisco Expo and um, around the country. Next slide. Here she is, of course, with Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, here's Sister Providencia with some of the women she worked with. Next slide. Uh, some of the young women who worked in the project making gloves. So gloves became a really, uh, really important product of this particular project of the Kateri Craft, Craftwork Cooperative. Next slide. Here is a display of their gloves um, and the um, trademark that they came up with for their group, for the cooperative. Next slide. Another display of their gloves. Next one. Um, they actually went to Gloversville, New York, and uh, studied with uh, the glove makers there. Um, at this time, gloves were being made. Women would produce uh, work from home and um, the, uh, the company that produced the gloves would then distribute them. And they wanted to, what they wanted to do was go and study this and see if there were methods and approaches that they could adapt for their endeavor. Um, Joseph Gary, who became very, very important in the, uh, it, as a, a figure, a political figure uh, for Native groups in the mid 20th century, traveled with um, Sister Providencia to New York to study, to study this. Next slide. There she is with Eleanor. Next slide. Um, let's go back to that previous one. Um, this was a display of the women's work at, at, um, at the Capitol in the caucus room House Indian Affairs Committee in DC in 1941. So Sister Kateri, I mean, Sister Providencia went, to, took the products to DC, displayed them there, tried to drum up interest in them. Next slide. And um, they ran ads actually in the New York Times for the gloves that they produced. Next slide. Now, these are the types of gloves that the women, um, that the Skitswitch women preferred to make. They were traditional designs, uh, the geometric and the floral designs, but uh, Darnancourt discouraged them from making these kinds of gloves because he said that people outside of the native community wouldn't wear them. Next slide, that they were too, too heavily decorated. Um, now here's an example of work that was done in that community. You can see the American flags and the star and very, very innovative, very beautiful work that was done to honor family members and gifted to those family members. Next slide. 
Um, this is Mary Arippa and her, da her two, da two daughters, excuse me. She became um, a very important bead worker. Next slide. And one of the things that they did since beadwork was to honor important individuals in the community, uh, what they did was they made uh, vestments for, for the priest um, who worked in the community, Father Brown. You can see the, uh, the apparel here. These are on display, next slide, at Old Mission State Park in Coeur d'Alene. You can see them today, um, if they're still up. I haven't been there in a couple of years. Um, and then, okay, so then the last, um, the last aspect of these projects that I'm gonna talk about is the Navajo weaving projects, are the Navajo weaving projects at the Southwestern Range and Sheet Breeding Lab in Fort Wingate, New Mexico. Now I showed you um, some slides of uh, what was being done at Fort Wingate in terms of production of native arts and crafts and, and important weaving projects there. But what they did at Fort Wingate, the most important thing they were involved in was testing wools, testing fibers, um, producing weavings that they could test out for durability. Next slide. The uh, weaving that you see on the floor here is a weaving that, well, it actually consists of, I think it was, it's either six or eight weavings, separate weavings that were sewn together. And they were placed um, in, on the floor of the cafeteria of the Department of Interior Building and people walked on them and dropped food on them. And, um, and then they were cleaned several times to see how they cleaned and to test their durability. Um, so they were very, very interested in coming up with a very durable yarn. And um, they were also interested in encouraging weavers to do designs that they thought would sell well. And they were also interested in promoting standardization of sizes, colors, that sort of thing. Next slide. Okay, so those are um, all the things that I've been studying. These are the archives that I've used. Um, I just thought I'd show you that to show you that there, there's just a wealth of information out there that you can draw upon. Next slide. No slide, let's just go back to that one. Okay. All right. Um, okay, are we gonna open it up to questions? Yes. Thank okay. you so much. That was a really interesting presentation, Jennifer. Thank you. Good, good, thanks. Um, and we do have several questions. Okay. So um, I just wanna start with, um, what do you think are the most enduring effects of the New Deal uh, Native Art Programs um, and the policies that endure or what their impacts were? Okay, well, I think the, the efforts to create trademarks um, and to uh, create certificates of authenticity, those sorts of things, you know, we have seen various permutations of that since that time, where um, individuals have tried to institute different, different um, methods of ensuring authenticity. Um, so they, they really pioneered a lot of, of that. Um, uh, strategies and, and ways to achieve that during that time. So that was very important. Um, and they also raised people's awareness that there was a problem with flooding of the market with fakes and inauthentic, inauthentic work and how this was hurting Native artists. Um, but probably I think the most positive thing that came out of it in terms of something concrete was uh, the cooperatives. The cooperatives are still operating today. Um, they're still successful. Uh, they are training or they're training people in marketing and uh, they are working with artists to, to improve their work, to make it more marketable. Um, so they're still, they're still operating. And, I, and uh, a number of people have pointed to the cooperatives as, as perhaps the most lasting effects. And the murals, of course, the murals are still there. The murals are almost like a historical artifact now, you know, that we see them within the historical context more than we see them as, as something of this time. Um, but, the, but they're still there and they're being restored and they're being taken care of. So I think those are probably the, the cooperatives and the murals were probably the, the highest impact. Mm 
Um, did Native American people have input into um, what they produced, what these projects required them to do? Yeah. Um, or was it kind of a top-down kind of paternalistic consultation? Well, there was a heavy element of paternalism because it was, you know, it was the 1930s. Um, and um, there was that paternalism, but there also was room for the voices of the Native artists. Um, and they did everything they could to bring in um, elders and, uh, you know, the older craftspeople to bring back techniques and approaches that, that had been lost. Um, and so a number of elders played very, very important roles in the programs and helped educate the younger people. Um, but it was still a time when there was that paternalism and there was less freedom to um, direct things by the native people. With the, the um, Navajo Arts and Crafts Guild, um, they had managers, directors that were native. They actually, they ran the uh, establishments. At first they had to have a lot of assistance because they hadn't, they hadn't gone to business school. Um, you know, they, there, there was just a certain um, degree of education that they had had and they needed to learn on the job. And so they had supervisors at first to help with that, but then they were handed the projects, the cooperatives were handed over completely to the native people after a certain point. So yeah, they had a lot of input. Okay. Um, the, well, the women had a pretty big role, at least as artists. Um, yeah. Were they excluded from any of the native art programs? Um, some of the painting projects they were excluded from. and. That wasn't necessarily a uh, something that was imposed upon them by uh, by non-native people. It was more imposed upon them by the the native community. That in some of the native communities, it was not proper for women to do representational painting, like among Sioux. Uh, I mean, sorry, um, Lakota and Dakota groups. Um, women are, it is not proper for women to do representational imagery. They are to do, they are properly to do abstracted imagery. Um, and um, so some of the restrictions were imposed from within the communities, especially on say painting. That's, that's where you see that kind of restriction coming in. But no, they were welcome in all the other projects. And there was a very strong desire to promote these forms among the women um, but there was often um, maybe a little too much uh, meddling in what went on because some of the Navajo weavers were very upset because information was being gathered on native dyes and they didn't think that was proper. Um, so, you know, th there were there were some problems, but, um, and, and with Navajo weaving, there was such a huge involvement of the government in the programs um, that some of these problems did develop among Navajo weaving projects. Yeah, someone asked about the, the Hogan murals that you mentioned that one of them was covered up. Yeah. Um, do you know why or what that mural looked like? Yeah, it had, um, it was the first mural in the series. And what it showed was um, the native people, um, actually there, was, uh, there were some murders of priests or executions of priests during the Pueblo revolt and um, during that period of time. And uh, they showed uh, priests and native people together and they felt that that could be uh, a bit, uh, damaging um, or uh, they didn't they didn't favor that kind of representation showing violence um, and also it was basically showing more Pueblo people than it was showing Navajo people um, so there were a number of objections to it I and mean, it's hard to get anybody to tell you exactly why they covered it up <laughs> but you know those are the, some of the things that I've been told that were problematic um so how effective were the arts and crafts boards in promoting high-end sales of Native American arts and crafts 
one of the uh, questioners mentioned um, Maria Martinez, for example, mm -hmm. as um, someone who was a recognized artist. And I'm just wondering uh, the role of popularizing um, these crafts that fell to the, um, the crafts boards, but did they right. also promote you know, expensive high-end sales? Yeah, that, that's one of the things that Rene Dardencourt wanted to do. He wanted to generate a high-end market. And that's one reason why he wanted Indian Art of the United States to take place in New York City, was he felt that he could tap into that market for luxury goods. Um, and um, they used display techniques at the major, you know, uh, high-end uh, department stores and, and um, to try to appeal to those consumers. So he really targeted the high-end consumer because he also felt that if you target a high-end consumer, they're willing to pay more, you can create a more high quality product. And he was very interested in, in retaining quality um, and returning um, native art to the quality it had established for it before tourism um, degraded the quality. Mm -hmm. There's been a couple of questions about the CCC restoration projects. Mm -hmm. um, were they based on archaeological research or were they done in consultation with the tribes or did they just kind of yeah. well, paste them back together? <laughs> <laughs> well, there were a number of um, academics in Arizona and uh, particularly in Arizona who were involved in some of the projects and, you know, they had ideas about how they should be restored, which turned out to be not very good ideas later. Um, and um, they perhaps had a little too much control over the projects because they instituted some new techniques that weren't as durable as they thought they would be for the restoration of the ruins. Um, so there were academics involved in, in that end of things. <laughs> the native people were more involved in, in the labor the labor of it. Um, I don't know of any major efforts to consult with the Native groups about the ruins restoration. And were those CCC Native American groups, were they supervised by Native people or by Caucasians? By Caucasians, to my knowledge, yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, those programs weren't open to women, the CCC projects, but what they did was they actually had uh, CCC camps where they allowed the women to come and stay with their husbands, um, which wasn't the case at other CCC camps. But they they understood the importance of family and and the need to have the wives and the wives there, and they developed programs for the wives as well. So there were women involved in the CCC projects, just not in the official capacity and not being paid. Um, there's a question as well about the influence from the art schools on the ledger projects, the ledger paintings, which, which came first? Um, well, ledger art, ledger art is very old, of course, um, but, but of course the uh, painting of, of ledger art on paper is much more recent and that developed at, at Fort Marion um, during and I don't know the dates, so I don't remember exactly, but they were Kiowa prisoners who were taken to Fort Marion. They, um, they did ledger art. They started to do it on paper there to sell to people who visited the prisons. Um, and they, they started to make money off of it. Well, that was long before you know, the New Deal projects. Um, and Dorothy Dunn used ledger art as one of the bases for that style of painting that she developed. Of that she taught at the Santa Fe Indian School. So she used ledger art in that, but there really wasn't, uh, I haven't come across anything about production of ledger art under the New Deal programs. Okay. And then um, just one more thing. I, I'd love to give you the opportunity to talk about the Smithsonian exhibit that you're working on. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, it's a uh, an exhibition of a, a contemporary native weaver, D.Y. Begay. Uh, D.Y. And, and I have worked together for quite some time. We've done a couple of exhibits together, curated together. And the exhibit is being cur curated actually by D.Y., me, a conservator, and uh, one of the um, NMAI curators. We're all working as a team. 
and DUI is on that team. So, you know, she's, when you talk about native sovereignty, I mean, they really want to, to um, reinforce that. They want it to be, you know, known that DUI is one of the major voices in the curation of this show. Um, and that is important. And she is only the second, let's see, the second native woman artist to have a one person exhibition with them. Um, so it's a big deal. And when is it gonna be? It's, uh, it will, well, the starting date at this point is uh, September of uh, 2024. So it's a little over two years away. Okay. And there will be a publication, which will be nice. Um, and lots of reproductions of DY's work. DY is, uh, does not do, her weavings do not look like traditional Navajo weaving. Um, they're done with traditional techniques and traditional materials, but they aren't the traditional designs of Navajo weaving. She's very much a contemporary artist and, and works from an inner imperative, you know, rather than doing traditional work. Yeah. I just want to thank you so much for this presentation. I've learned so much and, and a lot of people, you know, indicated as well how much they appreciated what you what you offered today. So oh, thank great. you thanks. so much. And yeah. thanks everyone for, for your interest and for tuning in today. Um, we look forward to seeing you again at, at our webinars. We've got um, some coming up that um, you can learn about on the website. And just to remind you, this and the other webinars are posted on the website, livingnewdeal.org, and also on our Facebook page. So on March 17th, our guest is going to be Harold Porche, and he's going to talk about Los Tres Grandes, how the Mexican muralists influenced the WPA artists. And we hope that you'll join us. And just to say your donations to the Living New Deal make programs like this available to everyone free of charge. Um, so thank you so much for your support and, and stay well and, and good night. <laughs> thank Thanks, you. Jen. Thanks. <laughs>